what we are, in fact, going to do is um, Polly is going to talk to Andrew briefly, uh, or for a, shor a shorter time, perhaps, than they would have done before, and then we will be throwing the session uh, open to you to talk not only about what they will have discussed, but any issues that came up this morning, or indeed any other humanist issues or things that you've read of Polly's that you would like to ask her about. So who is Polly Toynbee? Well, <laughs> she's been our very successful president for three years and has kindly offered to go on in that role uh, until we find um, a replacement for Grayling. She has, of course, been at The Guardian for over 30 years in, in different roles. So there was a seven-year gap while she was a social affairs editor at the BBC, and for three years she was associate editor of The Independent. She's won several national press awards as columnist of the year, and she often writes and speaks on issues which concern humanists and the rise of religious fundamentalism, uh, faith school she's written about, equality, secularism, and she's written a number of social commentary books, including in 2003, Hard Work, um, Life in Low Pay Britain, which was about an experimental period living on the minimum wage. And she wrote Unjust Rewards in 2008, and her most recent book is with David Walker, and it's called The Verdict, Did Labour Change Britain? And she's a passionate campaigner for social justice and equality, as well as for humanism. So I'm going to hand you over to her and Andrew. Well, it's going quite well so far, this conference, don't you think, Molly? <laughs> Very well indeed. <laughs> okay, good. Well, let's, I, th I suppose we'll talk uh, a little bit uh, later about maybe some of the highlights of your uh, time as president in the last four years. But let's start with this question of meaning. Um, how did you... Re yes. Can you hear me now? It's not too close. Feels very intimate, but <laughs> I don't... Okay. We thought there would be lapel mics, but obviously not. Okay. What does it all mean, Polly? What meaning do you think? of life. Right. Well, is it a meaningful question? That's the first uh, question to ask. And I think there would be some humanists who might think that it's not um, and would shy away from it because it sounds as if it presupposes something outside of us or something preordained beyond us in some, in some way. I think... Uh, the meaning of life is just as relevant a question for humanists as for people with w w religious beliefs of one kind or another. I think we are programmed uh, to believe in progress and to believe in the possibility of what we can achieve and what we can achieve together as social beings, uh, as, as a collective entity of humanity. I think Julie didn't like the word humanity, but of as human beings operating together. I think we believe in change and change for the better. It doesn't mean we achieve it. It doesn't mean we can necessarily point to some inevitable path of, of human progress and improvement. But there is something inside us which has, you know, you could say, is part of the explanation for our extraordinary uh, path of evolution that pushes us to believe in it. I mean, I don't think a crow or a fox or has any other idea than continuing to be as they are, whereas we seem to think, and maybe sometimes we fool ourselves, that uh, we must change, we must move on, we must improve, we must think, make things better, even if sometimes in the process we make things worse. I think it's so hardwired into us that if you ask any individual, nobody would deny that they had this sense. Uh, and, and sense of obligation um, that we must try. And so it doesn't worry me too much. 
uh, you know, ask any one individual what it is that they feel they should be doing or they think that we should be doing or they think society as a whole should be doing or governments should be doing, and they might all give very different answers, but I think they'd all be impelled by the sense that there is an ought and a should and must and uh, that we must keep on changing, transforming and trying to make better. I mean, that's obviously certainly been true of you, part of your work has been as a social activist trying to achieve more equality, uh, more justice, uh, socially more change. Um, but when you say it's true of everyone, is, they, is the evidence overwhelming that that's the case? Well, I think so, even of people who have not of my political persuasion. I mean, I, on the whole, basically, for instance, respect politicians. I think most of them, uh, you know, there are a few bad hats, but most of them, on the whole, go into it because they want to make some change for the better as they see it, even if I profoundly disagree with their vision of what's better. If they think shrinking the state will make everybody into better, happier people, uh, atomized individuals striving for themselves and their families, they at least believe that's so, on the whole. I will fight them tooth and claw and say <laughs> it ain't. But... Um, I think they're motivated by that same fundamental sense that uh, they want to get in there and change things for the better. When you say that that is one of the possible meanings of life, do you mean that um, in being socially active, in working for that sort of social change, you find meaning in your own life, it's fulfilling to you, or do you think that there's some sort of more altruistic purpose to it? Um, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely essential to me, but it also drives me mad because it doesn't often happen that you can actually say things have progressed and sometimes you know I think we're in an era now of seeing things regressing uh, quite rapidly in a way that alarms me a great deal or you could look at the last era and say how much was wasted and missed of a golden opportunity where more so much more could have been done so it's not exactly a happy path. You might be happier to say nothing should ever change and I'm quite contented as I am and leave things as they are. But I don't think many people really think that. And whether they're sort of Daily Mail readers and deeply distressed by the Daily Mail's constant portrayal of the world getting worse and worse and going to hell in a handcart, or whether they're social progressives, I think everybody has a sense that... Um, things ought to be different, could be different, and even if they don't themselves get very involved, which most people don't very much, um, they feel a sort of a sense of emotional involvement with the society around them and what they're reading and seeing and feeling about it. It's a very important part of being human and of human discourse and conversation and discussion. How are we doing together collectively? How do we feel? Are we better or are we worse? Where's it going? Also spoken before of the role that imagination and creativity plays in giving meaning to our lives. How did you react to some of the uh, topics raised in the talks this morning? Yes, I've always felt, um, as a humanist, the necessity to defend us against the constant allegation that we are poor, miserable, shriveled up souls, dried up rationalists with no uh, inner life, at all. Uh, we want to reduce everything to its barest scientific minimum. I wasn't here for, for Peter's talk, but I shall certainly read what he's written. Um, and I absolutely understand where he's coming from when he says that science can and will eventually explain everything. And s but nevertheless, even if it explains it, it is my very strong belief that the most important part of being human is the life of our imagination and of our creativity, and that all of us, all of the time, I and mean, all of you sit sitting here may think you're actually here, but most of you are actually living in your heads and you're somewhere else. You're thinking about yesterday, tomorrow, something else. You are actually much busier in your head than you are listening to our words here. That is where we live. That's what we inhabit. If you l want to call it spiritual zone, it doesn't worry me. I'm not worried about the word spiritual. That's all right. It's the other place. You could call it transcendent, if you like. But most of us are preoccupied with our imaginings. You can be very instrumental about it and say, but that's exactly what evolution destined. Because we are able to plan and think ahead and to look behind and look for, pa for patterns and shapes and plan ahead and imagine being other people and imagine what other people, how other people might think and feel, 
we are therefore much, much better at doing all the things that human beings have done so well. So it has a, a practical purpose, all this imagination. And you see it in children when they, very young children, learn to play, that they are rehearsing and practicing and trying things out, and we're all playing in our heads all the time. And I think that's a wonderful, creative part of, of, of humanity. And the idea that somehow we are rational, no, we're not at all. We're highly rational. And to be a humanist, you don't have to claim to be some super rational being. You can be as full of fantasy and romance uh, as you want. That's fine. That is part of being human too. And it's very important that we don't allow them to paint us into that miserable list corner uh, of being dried up old sticks, because we're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, usually the moment where someone, Life of Brian style, jumps up and goes, I am. <laughs> <Some sort of, laughs> but I don't think no one's going to do that today. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about your time then in the last four years, which you've enjoyed thoroughly and has given great meaning to your life uh, as president of the BHA. Oh, it's been wonderful. I have absolutely loved it. I think it's been the greatest honour, actually. And, 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 and I've been very boastful. It's wonderful to be able to say, I'm president of the British Human Society. <laughs> It kind of takes conversations to another level very often, and often, a, and often a better level where you could discuss all kinds of things. Um, I think it's a marvellous, a marvellous organisation. I also think that this is now uh, a time of incredible importance for humanism, for secularism. Uh, I think that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it seemed like a fairly dead duck. It seemed like it's, it's just taken for granted that we are becoming a more and more secular society. Fewer and fewer people are affected by religion one way or another. So what do you want to go on with it for? Isn't that really a sort of historic movement um, of not much relevance now? And I don't think I would have predicted at all quite what a hot subject religion has become and how much it matters. How on earth are European or other societies to live together in a, melt, in a melting pot com of communities with passionate religious beliefs, conflicting religious beliefs, conflicting moral beliefs, strongly held, unless you can say the state must stand apart from that. The state must, you know, you're allowed your own beliefs, but the, the public and the, and, and, and the private sphere really must be del delineated, otherwise we'll run into serious trouble. And I think people begin to get that, they understand it, and suddenly it seems like a very live issue in a way that it really wasn't. And I think it matters hugely for where we are now. Uh, I wouldn't have predicted either, say, five years ago, um, that we'd be at a time when it looks as if a lot of public services uh, are going to be put out in one way or other, outsourced, and by far the best placed of, um, uh, apart from the private sector, which is by far the best place, but w in, the, in the voluntary sector, will be all the religious organisations. And when it comes to the localism bill, where anybody any local group can challenge to run any service they want, that's where all of you have got to be absolutely sharp eyes and ears for what's happening in your own locality. And the government will be very, very keen to hand it on to uh, any voluntary organisations that come up, which will be pretty much a fig leaf for the really big day marsh, which will be the private sector, because even the churches, big though they are, are still very small compared to a huge step forward by the, by the private sector. As a result, they won't look very closely at questions of whether this is uh, a, a religious or a non-religious voluntary group that comes forward. And on the whole, the most organised in every area will always be the churches, because there they are in churches with vicars, with committees, with schools very often, with governing bodies, with people who will look quite credible at stepping forward saying, we'll do this, we'll do that. Um, I has been talking to Naomi, who's, I mean, Naomi's work on this has been absolutely crucial, and it was very prescient when you produced your document, first of all, that before this had quite got going in a big way, that uh, reminding people how many s local services may be and are being taken over by religious groups that will be uh, very hard to access for people who are not of that faith 
or of no faith at all. And, you know, we'll be asking people to say prayers and, and making expectations of them. Um, and even if they're not, people will simply shy away from them because they are faith groups running those services. And Naomi's just been telling me about um, one or two I hadn't heard of. I did know about the disgraceful case of the Salvation Army taking over trafficked women from the Eves Project, which is a wonderful group that I've known about for and, and, and have followed their work for years. And their work's been handed to the Salvation Army for trafficked women of all kinds of faiths or none. And, I mean, that really, you know, the Salvation Army is a very, very missionary movement. Uh, and uh, that's extremely alarming. The, um, uh, also in public services, um, we're with the localism bill, it really will be that anybody can step forward and ask uh, and pretty much get the right, if they're at all competent, to, to run almost any service at all. You're going to have Christian libraries or whatever. Um, Christian dentists, or someone Christian mentioned, yeah. Christian dentists. There was, a, there was a bishop in the House they of Lords. They do it without anaesthetic, do they? They do, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Christian dentists. Christian dentists. There was a bishop in the House of Lords saying they were very interested in, in NHS dental contracts. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's quite scary. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see how many takers they yes. get. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, public sec the public services white paper has been delayed and delayed and delayed. It was supposed to come out in February. And it was called originally, I think it's changed its name now, it was called Public Services Open for Business. Uh, I think it'll have a slightly more, um, less rebarbative name this time. But again, that will be the same thing. It will be saying, uh, you know, ways in which everything can be prized open. We're going to have big debates about the House of Lords. I mean, you could just shut your ears and forget about it because it ain't going to happen. I mean, the House of Lords reform is not going to happen, so it's not worth over-investing your anger and fury at the idea that the white paper says there are going to be 12 bishops there as a right, better than 26, but 12, uh, 20 a 20% appointe uh, appointed house, and of course we know that within that 20% there will be immediate push by all the other faiths to try and take up their 12 places for each of, for each of them in no time at all. But I, I seriously, I mean, I would be astonished if that ever gets through in the time. The Lords are determined to prevent it, and, I, and, 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 and the Conservatives and the Commons are not at all keen on it, so they'll allow Nick Clegg to waste an inordinate amount of time talking about it, but it ain't going to happen. Um, Naomi and I were also talking about marriage law, and um, I think that's an excellent campaign that, you know, humanist celebrants should be recognised absolutely as equal and be allowed to conduct full marriage ceremony without having to go through two. Um, there are, so there are an awful lot of things happening now that are very, very important and relevant. And every reason why we should all go out and recruit many more people because the other thing that the churches always say is, of course, you know, so how many battalions have you got then? <laughs> um, you know, what, why is it you don't have very many members compared to the numbers of people who are members of churches and faiths of all kind? And I say, well, you know, all the rest are ours. <laughs> <laughs> but we do need to... Um, but we, it would be very helpful if we could sign more of them up. It really would be. <laughs> by direct debit. No, by, that's, the best, that's the best way right, of Andrew, doing listen, it. All right, Andrew, listen. You're just sitting there. I, and, you know, it was meant to be AC Grayling, and I was really going to be asking him the questions. So I'm going to ask you the meaning of life question. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I think it's, um, you know, you, you think about these things all of the time. It is, you know, your full-time occupation. It's not what I'm paid to do, actually, to think about the meaning of life all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I think I... I that James, James Hemming, who was uh, probably some of you knew him, certainly all of you will have heard of him, uh, wrote very good lines on the meaning of life in his book, I think on individual morality, where he said, in life the meaning comes in living. And I think that's a very humanist sort of idea. And the Norwegian humanists actually uh, had a poster, since one of them is here, uh, that had the happy human uh, logo on it, and the logo over it said, humanists say yes to life. <laughs> and I think that's another uh, sort of of way of looking at it, in that the idea that meaning somehow has to come from outside our lives as we live them, and that can't be found in the here and now, but has to come from some sort of ultimate, afterwards, post-mortem, or separate, non-human source, I think is one that we have to completely reject. Um, but in rejecting it, we have a more positive 
source of meaning, which is the here and now, the lives we're living, each other, the fact that we're all going to be having dinner together uh, this evening and that we're all sharing this conversation right now. I think they're the sort of moments that give meaning and richness to life. And I'm sure AC Grayling would entirely agree. <laughs> <laughs> but Okay, do you want to go to some questions? Yes, I'm sure absolutely. everyone's got some questions. Questions on anything, anything really, uh, from, mean, from, the, from the meaning of life to, to Polly's time as, as our president. Um, and I think that it's possible that um, we, we have the only two microphones in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Can we take this one out? Yes. Does somebody want to take a microphone? You have to knit round fast. I'll do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you take this one, Lizzie, and I'll let you take it. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll start off with, I mean, it's really a, a political question, but, but while I've got you, Polly, there on the, on the stage, I'm going to ask it. I've, um, I love your column, but I've, I've almost stopped reading it um, because I kind of want you to give me hope. And the column <laughs> <laughs> delineates all the, all, the, all the terrible things that are, that, that are going on. What, what's the best thing that we can do? Because it, it's a disaster waiting to unfold um, have we really got to see out the, the life of this parliament? Well, I think un what's unfolding now, bit by bit, all of these cuts that are doing, which I keep chronicling and warning about in this Cassandra-like way, I know it's a one long howl, um, are all about to happen. A lot haven't really happened yet. So that again, all in your own areas, it's watching out for it. It's you know, writing to your local newspapers, it's getting involved in local action groups, it's having protests. Protests is amazingly, even quite small groups of people, if it's about something very specific and local, amazingly much more effective than you think. It is worth organizing. It is worth being there saying, do you realize this sure start is now only gonna be open two days a week? Um, and this many families will no longer access it. Or, you know, all that our shore start has become now is a, as a shell with a, a small private nursery in it. It's lost all of the services that gave it point and, and meaning and, and made a difference to lives of families in trouble. It's finding, it, it, it's taking the specific. And I think that way people sort of get it. Uh, there's such a sort of general sense of gloom We've got to deal with the deficit. Uh, absolutely, the deficit is the only thing that matters. But the opinion polls are beginning to show, people are beginning to say, well, hang on, is it really the only thing that matters in life? Is that really, is that really it? Nothing else matters at all. Or is it true that we could do it slower and, uh, uh, and more gradually, and that actually, if by going for growth, you will, um, You'll, you'll reduce the deficit a hell of a lot faster than you ever will through cuts. Cuts could get you into a death spiral, feeds in on itself, lower treasury receipts, uh, more people out of work, higher social security bills, and it's what's actually happening to the government at the moment. They are right off their target for the amount of deficit reduction they're expecting this year, miles off, because they've got into this cutting state of mind. So it's persuading, it's arguing, it's saying there is another way. And, you know, I find it quite extraordinary that Keynes can have been forgotten and we're back to the era of Herbert Hoover. I mean, how can it be that what Roosevelt proved has been wiped off the slate altogether and we're back to a kind of year zero of economic primitivism? And having that argument, making that case, uh, getting people to see it locally. Um, you know, I would say join, joining local activist groups wherever you can, including political parties, and, you know, making the case. Um, I can't be any more hopeful than that because I feel absolutely despairing at so much of what I see going on, things that have been built up by really good people over a long time just being destroyed at the stroke of a pen by people who don't know them, understand them, haven't been to see them, don't understand the people who are affected, know nothing. That's what makes me shout so loud because I know that they simply haven't bothered to find out what this service is or who the clients are. One, <coughs> excuse me. One word that hasn't been mentioned so far is conscience. Now, is that a thing like humanity that really doesn't exist? Or does it come about, uh, in the case of a humanist, from 
the bringing up, or uh, rather than from a, obviously a fear of future retribution. Uh, so it depends upon one's parents. I did once have a situation after, fairly soon after I became a humanist where I'd gone through the checkout and realized there were a couple of bottles of booze which hadn't been checked in. And I took them back. And my feeling was that I wouldn't like to argue with a Christian about honesty if I done, hadn't done so. I think the person in the checkout was very surprised and a bit worried that the fact that I'd come back would indicate she wasn't doing her job properly. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, it, it, somewhere or other, I think it does come in the way we order our lives. There was the case of the thuggy who, when asked uh, as he was dying, is there anything he regretted? He said he regretted they hadn't killed enough people. That was his conscience. So it does seem to come from that sort of side of things as well. Well, we all interpret our conscience in different ways. And if you're into some sort of dreadful civil war, then maybe killing a lot of the other side seems to you to be the good thing to do. It's not that consciences necessarily get it right any more than faiths get it right. I and mean, we know that people always think that they're acting, nearly always think they're acting in good conscience when they're doing the most monstrous things. So conscience is not always a good guide. That's why we need laws, constitutions, human rights acts, uh, worked out over a long time amongst a great many people, rather than leaving each person to their own individual conscience. As to whether the Christians have um, uh, better consciences than ours, I came across a very nice bit of research I used in a column, I don't know, sometime in the last year, uh, where it was from a German university, and they have an honor system for paying for newspapers in the street there. And so they watched people from afar putting money into a box. Um, and when the person had walked away, they'd quickly go and check in the box to see if they put the right amount of money and then follow the person for a bit so they didn't associate the interview with what they'd just done and ask them questions. And they found out that the people who were most honest were absolutely the opposite of what you'd think. They were the young, not the middle-aged and old, and the churchgoers were least honest. <laughs> So you never can tell. And that was, I mean, Ben Gold, Goldacre would say you'd have to do a whole lot more uh, trials than that. <laughs> but um, I, I think conscience is, is absolutely hardwired into us. You know, the first things that children from a youngest age have is a sense of what's right and fair. It's not fair is one of the most primitive and fundamental feelings that children have. And they do have a sense of, 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 of justice. And um, I think that's part of us being social animals and social beings. Um, how we then negotiate our rather different ideas of justice is about how you build communities, societies, legal systems, and civilization. But civilization is based on the notion that there is right and wrong, and we all know it so. And we don't need to construct somebody up there who will punish us. Because after all, one of the really interesting things is quite how unbelievably badly people behaved at a time when they, in medieval times, for instance, when people probably did think they really believed in burning hell, so Hieronymus Bosch-type visions. And yet even that didn't act as a deterrent. It didn't make people virtuous. So I've, I think it's partly that we are all of us, us too, us, rationalist folk too, capable of believing at least five impossible things before breakfast. And uh, we all do. We all have cons conflicting systems. We shouldn't imagine, you know, when I was talking about imagination, that we are that rational in all sorts of things we think. It depends whether you're being the, p the pedestrian or the motorist or the, the particular angle you're coming from. And we are all a whole number of different identities at different times. One thing that it did do for uh, people who uh, behave very badly, they gave money to the church to build churches and they were therefore <laughs> redeemed. We have Conway Hall. Hello, I'm Judith. We don't have time to answer your question, so there's no need to look so anxious when you raise your hand at the front here. You're definitely going to have time, yes. Hello, I'm Judith at Christian Chester, really enjoying listening to your conversation. Hold it right up. Cause it's yes. I'm sure, like many people here, you're sick to death of hearing about the big society and it could possibly well be perceived to be a threat for the British Humanist Association. But what opportunities do you see under the big society for this country? Well, I 
a big society is pretty much of a big con on the grounds that we already have one. I mean, a very, very large number of people volunteer a huge amount of time, and I'm sure that I can, you know, I just know from talking to lots of humanists over recent years how many of you in this room will be involved busily in volunteering of every kind, and whether it's from the level of, of being a councillor or a magistrate, or whether it's from the level of, of, you know, helping out with all sorts of things locally, people just do. So it's trying to kind of capture that and, and claim it for a political purpose. And I think quite a lot of the volunteering organizations are quite indignant about that because it sort of isn't political, it's something else. And it's something people do for all sorts of reasons, often for selfish reasons. They enjoy it, they have a good time, they do things together. They run a local football club for kids or whatever it is. And it's often for one's own pleasure and satisfaction. So I think the idea of using that as a fig leaf for monumental cuts, saying, don't worry, the big society will step in if we close our short start, we don't run the library. Well, you may be able to run libraries for a while in places like David Cameron's constituency, but you know, you're not going to run libraries in, 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 in Brixton and in uh, you know, all sorts of places, hard-pressed places, just and also people who need really specialist librarians, not just dropping in to, 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 to borrow a book. And um, I think it's just cheapskate con. And that, what's interesting is it's been so thoroughly seen through pollsters' reports of what people say about it, you know, almost unprintable. People don't like it and they, they spot that politicians are s stepping into their territory. This is another zone. So what opportunities do you see? What opportunities? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I have to say that given that the, the enormous cuts to the biggest volunteering organisations, CSV and all the others, are suffering huge cuts, the very people who are best at knowing how to get people in uh, at opening the door, the, the volunteer centres where you, in every area uh, there is a shop front where you can find all the different things you can do locally, whether it's prison visiting or whatever. Um, are being closed. It's quite hard to say that I think at the end of this we're going to see many more people doing much more. I mean, maybe things will get so bad that people simply will, whether it's running soup kitchens or what it's doing. Um, maybe lots of people will step forward and say, look, this is so bad, there are so many people in desperate need, so many old people who've got no longer got any kind of mobility allowance, so I will come and take old people out of old people's home, otherwise they will never leave because their mobility allowance, they just voted it through Parliament this week, um, means they can no longer have a taxi fare to go anywhere. Um, you know, it's things like that. Maybe people will step forward. Is that a hopeful sign? Does it make us a better society? I think not because, you know, we tried to run, for the welfare state, we tried to run welfare by charity and it didn't work. It can only really be done by taxation. It doesn't mean there isn't a place for volunteering too. Do you think I'm right? Well, I, I Hang on, give it back to her. I wonder if we as an organization, an association, perhaps need to become even more political than we are. Is well, all right, shall I ask a dangerous question? <laughs> no? no? <laughs> yes, all right. Is anybody here um, a conservative? Conservative Humanist Association within uh, the Conservative Party, as there are uh, humanist associations in all three of the main political parties uh, in Britain. That, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> just, just saying. Right. I just I may have intimidated anybody putting their hand up, actually. Um, no, I mean, I think you're right. I think what Julian was saying before about community and, commu and, and how churches act as community organizations, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of churches, whether they're Quakers or Unitarians or whoever, do wonderful community work and you know, no way denigrate. And so do Catholic churches in some of the poorest areas. And, and there are whole areas of the country where the only professional who lives there is the vicar. And so I don't in any way denigrate an awful lot of the social work they do. The social workers go home, the doctors go home, everybody else goes home to somewhere nicer. But very often the church has a real authentic validity there because they do live there and stay there. And I do think that, um, you know, we obviously, we ought to get as stuck in as we possibly can, as, as much as we can, but I suspect an awful lot of you do. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I think that that's often what what the, what the BHA has has. Uh, the conclusion that we've come to when we've discussed this sort of issue is that humanists do an enormous amount um, of uh, social, pro-social work, uh, charitable giving and also volunteering and working and so on. And they do it in secular organisations, i.e. organisations that bring people of all different religious and non-religious beliefs together, and that it wouldn't be a, 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 a of obvious benefit to try and uh, start some sort of separate, specifically humanist sort of social action projects. Having said that, with the board is looking at the moment in the BHA of developing more of a network of what we have informally at the moment, which is uh, volunteers who may visit uh, non-religious people, for example, in hospitals or in prisons or in other settings where they need the sort of support that religious groups might give to people through chaplaincies. And we're always open, the, 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 you know, the, the trustee is always open to exploring new sorts of ways of doing things. I mean, we do have uh, people uh, out there in the community, as it were, providing quite valuable services by way of ceremonies like our funerals, which provide uh, an extremely valuable service uh, to people which they just couldn't get elsewhere. Um, but apart from that, I'm sure that we're interested to hear suggestions. Uh, okay, no, sorry. Uh, my name is Harold Hillman from Guildford. I'd like to ask what the humans can do about a very serious situation at the moment with schools. As you undoubtedly know, legislation is in Parliament at the moment that 200 failing schools are going to be taken out of, uh, uh, of the uh, current system and put into academies, so-called. And these academies will not have inspection, which means that uh, the worst schools will be allowed to go on teaching badly indefinitely. That's one problem. And an allied problem is, uh, as you know, I think you pointed out in your uh, column, the Muslim schools which are inspected, the inspecting committee is responsible to the Muslim Council of Great Britain and is not responsible to the uh, local authorities. And that is a very serious matter indeed because it is highly divisive and I extremely inefficient. And I think we as humanists ought to take both of these matters on board and try to see what influence we can bear on both of them. Thank you. Absolutely right. Education is the most important. I mean, to have politicians talk, uh, have politicians talking um, about the need for community cohesion and not people not being segregated in silos uh, according to their community and their faith, and then deliberately creating more faith schools is quite utterly astonishing and you know labor were to blame but it's really going to accelerate now i think it's three of the first eight free schools that are opening in september are faith schools well that's a very high proportion one's sikh one's jewish one's c of e uh, i think the you know the whole academy movement it means as you say that they will be i think they'll be not inspected but a great deal less scrutiny and what the governors decide they want to do could be all sorts of weird and eccentric things. Um, I think, we know, or again, we know the opinion polls show that people don't think that more faith schools is a good idea or an answer to anything. But you better answer this because um, you're, 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 you know exactly where we are in terms sure, of... Sure, well, we're working on the, on the current educational bill with the Parliamentary Humanist Group, which is currently in the House of Lords. And uh, as I said this morning in the introduction to the weekend, um, we're working on uh, amendments... Uh, with some peers in the Parliamentary Humanist Group uh, to that bill. I think, and if anyone wants to know more about that, then you know Naomi uh, with her badge, um, and you should talk more to her about that uh, over the weekend. I think that the, the deregulation of, of, of the school system with the free schools and academies uh, programs being expanded is extremely concerning, because although there will be some sort of inspection, you're right, um, many elements and the most worrying elements from our point of view, i.e. the religious elements, will be inspected by separate religious inspectorates rather than by um, the secular authority. And that is obviously of, of, of great concern. It is already the situation now, however, as well, um, because in currently state-funded faith schools like Church of England schools or Muslim schools or Jewish schools or whatever, um, the religious education curriculum and worship is inspected um, uh, 
uh, by a religious inspectorate rather than by Ofsted. I know we have an Ofsted inspector somewhere in the in the audience, um, uh, but I won't point her out in case in case we also have some teachers. <laughs> but the <laughs> I think we'll go over here. Uh, for two questions. Um, I think I'll start taking them two at a time now. It's not that we're running out of time. We'll still be able to answer them both, but it would just hurry up the exchange of microphones. So, yes, and then... And then, and then. The last question has just sparked me off on uh, a favourite topic. I'm from Leicester. We have 25% of the children in the primary schools are Muslim now, 20% are Christian, and so it goes on. We have about 10 to 15% Hindu. So this is not an academic question when we look at the possibilities of schools moving to being uh, religious schools. But what I was going to comment on was the matter of what humanists can do, just as members of society, showing that they are able to help. Uh, my wife is very much involved with the Leicester City of Sanctuary organization, um, which looks after asylum seekers mainly. Uh, they lost their position in um, a, a bank building that was no longer used and found that the only place on offer was owned by the local diocese, the Church of England. Um, the attitude then was, if you want to help people, you use whatever is available. But the consequences of moving in, for free, I should say, is that we have now as the secular society and the humanists in Leicester have been able to make contact at a level that might not otherwise be possible. And so I was invited to give a talk to the Muslim Christian dialogue group and found that I was being supported in many ways. For example, the attitude of the Church of England in the 19th century was totally unacceptable. This was from the vicar and from a, an associate vicar. There's not a great deal between uh, humanists and and the modern Christian movement. And I should say that I'm also a trustee of the Sea of Faith, which is made up of people who are sometimes still within the church, but no longer believe and find themselves in difficulties. But the issue here is whether we get in at all levels as humanists and make our point that we can do something and it's not on a religious basis, it's on a humanist human basis. That's what I want to start Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I may make myself a bit unpopular here, but um, I was a bit concerned about the way the discussion was going earlier on, about the sort of assumption that there's an identity between humanism and socialism, or certainly a flavour of socialism. And are you actually saying that you couldn't envisage a, uh, a situation where, say, say, David Cameron and George Osborne were humanists, yet, because I don't think they actually think they do, they're, they're aiming for evil outcomes. I think they disagree, you would disagree with them about the means. And I should say, I'm not a, a conservative. But it, I, would, I would be very uncomfortable remaining a member of this group if I felt it was, equal, it was, it was synonymous with Labour Party. No, support. I did say very, very clearly that that wasn't the case. That I said when I thought that you know, there was a m human motivation profound motivation to make things better, that that applied to equally to people who are not of my ha particular political belief, or when we talked about conscience, that everybody has a different idea of what right and wrong might be, and therefore we have to negotiate collectively as to what arrangements we can come to to bring our consciences into some sort of alignment, or in democracies, vote for whoever is, is going to be in charge. So not in any sense, I didn't mean that at all. Um, I, I, in fact, I rather specifically said, you know, the people who want to shrink the state actually think they're going to make life better for people. It's not that they're wicked people. I really don't think on the whole they are. Um, they're just deluded. <laughs> but that's my opinion. So in no sense do I see um, the inevitable march of human progress like the sort of long march forward in some kind of socialist, not at all. I actually think, when I think about politics and the human brain, I think that there are two sides to the brain. There is, and, and this is true wherever you go in the world, that there is a you know, small l, liberal, uh, small c, conservative side of the brain. And we each have some of both in our heads. And there needs to be a certain balance between, between those things. 
And wherever society you land in, anywhere in the world, you very quickly meet people who are either liberal inclined, inclined or conservative inclined. And I think within each of us too, we all have that dichotomy and either some of us go more that way, some more this way. But I do think it's probably a, na a natural balance that some people need to be pushing for radical progress and other people need to be saying, you know, hang on a bit, hang on a bit, don't lose traditional values. Um, so that I think it's, you know, it's an interesting notion about that. But it does seem to be a universal human condition, this right-left dichotomy. But it's certainly, you know, all virtue is not on one side. It's just that I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> Pass okay. to the gentleman over there. Um, I wanted to bring it to back to education. Um, not that I'm in favour of anything other than secular schools. Um, given the current political kind of sense is that we should have um, moral, moral values instilled in our schools, what do you think would be the vision of a humanist school? Great. Knowing how closely the humanist movement was involved directly in politics in the 1960s, I was somewhat concerned when we applied for charitable status because I felt that this could in the future hinder what we were able to do politically. Quite clearly, many of the things we are now concerned with are political issues, can you envisage a time when we are going to need to forego that status so we can become more directly involved with political matters? And I don't mean party political. Gentleman here. Yes. Uh, I get a lot of email correspondence uh, from the BHA, but I also get a lot from the National Secular Society. Um, I don't know anything about the, the history of the relationships between the two bodies, but it seems to me that very much the two uh, organizations are working towards the same ends. To what extent do we work I in tandem and in cooperation? Okay, back there. I, I was just wondering that um, with, given that we have a, a deputy prime minister who is a declared atheist, uh, how are, uh, how all of these bad things, especially in education, uh, have been happening. Um, why, ha why hasn't he uh, stepped in? Yes, can I just re re Polly's dichotomy into two types? I think tough-minded, tender-minded captures quite a lot. And the other thing I wanted just to mention, Daniel Dennett's excellent, excellent book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, all about Darwinism and natural selection, is subtitled Darwinism and the Meanings of Life, plural. Okay. Elizabeth Donnelly from Mansfield. What single thing has happened in the last two years that maybe you've led for, that you're really proud of about being president of the Humanist Association? I heard that um, when David Cameron was in his detoxification of the Conservative Party mode, he talked to you. What did he say? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Saxon Spence from Devon, who has to confess to being a politician. And I'm on the standing committee for a religious education and I do uh, it's taken sort of 20 years to get humanism uh, even recognized um, and the f I do think we need therefore to be very vigilant about working through sacres and agreed syllabuses because I think it is really important that every child does have access to real education <coughs> um, uh, not this view that uh, children without a religious background aren't entitled to have morals or ethics. But do you think we should, as a, I'm a recent member, you know, having put my money where my mouth is, do you think we are giving enough support and guidance to families outside of schools? Have we exhausted your questions yet? Okay, cool. Oh, go on then. 
Uh, this is a question about Polly, for Polly. Uh, I was not originally a Polly Toynbee fan. She came and addressed the Conference of Celebrants two years ago. I'm a humanist funeral celebrant, and she inspired me by talking eloquently about magic. She had a filthy cold at the time. I don't know if you remember that, Polly. Um, uh, I would like to ask Polly if she would consider staying on as president of the BHA, because for me, she represents the future of the BHA, not a group of... <laughs> middle-aged and elderly white people talking about God all the time and religion, but about practical engagement with the rest of humanity. That's what humanism should be about. Polly, an, obvi an obvious plant. <laughs> we, know, we, know your, we know your political history. He's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the constitutions are constitutions and my time is up uh, and I'm delighted to stay on for a while until I find somebody else and of course I'd love to stay but that's, I, I, you know, you don't break constitutions. Um, I, and it's very kind of you to say that. Um, I've, I've really had a great time and uh, meeting celebrants has been terrific. Um, a moral, hu a humanist school, what would a humanist school be like? It would just be a very good school. <laughs> it would be very open-minded. Dead? No. Um, it, there isn't something specific about humanism other than free thinking, open minds. It, you know, it's not a philosophy in that sense. In that sense, you know, the person who picked me up on it being political, it's not political in that small sense. But I think that um, anybody who sent their child to a, to a humanist school would accept, expect a great deal of philosophy, a great deal of critical thinking. The best parts of education are those courses. Actually, you know, A-level philosophy course is brilliant, and so is critical thinking. Wonderful, uh, just for getting people going. Uh, I think we'd have a lot of that in it. Um, political, political issues and charitable status. I'll ask you to say something um, uh, 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 about that, Andrew. I think that um, everything is political. Uh, the Charity Commission has got itself into a lot of trouble trying to police what's acceptable and not. But it seems to me that our purposes in terms of keeping religion um, separate to uh, the operations of the state and social services and education and so on is very specific and is very small p political. We wouldn't have had been allowed to have charitable status were it not that we are permitted to campaign for these things and against the encroachment of religion into state functions. So I don't see that as being a live issue, however hard we campaign against some of these things that are happening. Am I right? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the current Charity Commission guidance is very clear that as long as the political activity in which you're engaged is ancillary to your charitable purposes, and in the case of ours, it certainly is, given that our political activity, with a small p, um, is all focused either around ensuring the state is secular and treats people equally, or is campaigning with an ethical, with a humanist ethical flavour, like, for example, uh, in terms of uh, the abortion laws or stem cell research or whatever, that it is sufficiently in keeping with our charitable purpose for us to be fine. And I think under the current guidance, really the only thing, um, almost if you're, if you're a charity, that you can't do is support specific political parties. Although that didn't stop the Catholic Church at the last election pointing out that the Liberal Democrat manifesto would be inconsistent with their uh, views. Although we did make a complaint to the Charity Commission uh, about that, which was not successful. <laughs> it would have been very exciting if we got the Catholic Church struck out of being a charity. <laughs> it would have been, wow, quite an achievement. The next one is really for you. It's about the NSS. I've always been an associate uh, of, of the NSS as well. So yes, of course. That? We work with the National Secular Society when our shared aims make that possible. And um, in many of the areas where we work uh, in, in, in campaigning, uh, those aims are very much shared. The Deputy Prime Minister is an atheist. It was great when he said that. It was rather sad when he had to pull it back and say, oh, no, I'm an agnostic. Because an ag <laughs> agnostic is only an atheist who pretends, doesn't dare say so. Um, uh, you know, it's a sort of polite thing. It's like, I'm not a feminist, but it's the sort of, you know, the, 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 the secular equivalent. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's trimmed on so many things. Uh, I guess this is just another bit of trimming, and uh, he certainly doesn't seem to have had anything to say about uh, religion and education. I don't know whether it might be worth trying to approach him at some point and say, look, 
come to a meeting. Let's, ha let's have a discussion. Perhaps it would be a good idea. Yeah. Very good idea. Very good idea. He, he did, but before he was, you know, Deputy Prime Minister, when he was just leader of the Lib Dems, he did stop by our stand at the Lib Dem conference both years um, to say, oh, I was a member of the Cambridge Humanists and so on. So I think by all means we should, Naomi, make a note. We're going to, we're going to call Nick Clegg on, on Monday. Or you are. <laughs> I hope that that's what you do. <laughs> Very good. David Cameron, no, he didn't actually talk to me. He just, he, he, he mentioned my name and... And, and, and in his detoxifying uh, phase of his political life, early on when he was hugging huskies and hoodies, he sort of hugged me too, but not personally. He simply <laughs> said, um, I'd used an analogy in my book, Hard Work, I'd used an analogy about talking about inequality um, of a, a camel train crossing the desert, saying that at what point when the head of the camel train has gone over several sand dunes and out of sight of all the rest and the tail at the back is as, uh, out of sight of all the rest and they all can't even see each other any longer. At what point can you really say they're all still in the same caravan? At what point are we all still in the same society when you can have, you know, the bankers <coughs> earning 200 times uh, the average wage? Um, and he said that he liked this analogy but, of course, he didn't actually believe that you should measure things by Gini coefficients or by uh, any sort of measure of inequality because he didn't really think that was the right way of doing it. And it didn't matter at all what happened to the, to the people up at the front, though you might try and pull up the people at the back a bit. Um, so that was as far as the embrace went, I'm afraid. Not far enough. Well, um, this brings us to the end of this session. We've already had many... Uh, strong views expressed in our conference so far, and now many of those have been Polly's. So I'm very glad uh, to thank her now on your behalf for her session with us today, and to thank her also for her excellent four years as our president. Grayling and uh, sharing his views on the future with us. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah.